This is uh, Rich Blake. I'm the clinic chair of the Skagit Valley and Whidbey NMRA clinic. And we are part of the fourth division of the Pacific Northwest region. Um, we do monthly clinics and lately we've been doing them on Zoom. So tonight's presentation, we have Susan Gonzalez. She's my program, one of my, my program coordinator, my right hand woman, I guess, helps, helps me run the show here. So it's a privilege to have her uh, do a presentation. It's very creative, very imaginative. And I was gonna do a presentation tonight on flat car loads that uh, everybody kind of takes for granted, but uh, it's a very important part of your, of your layout. So with that, Susan, it's all yours. So um, this is the title uh, and it's also how I learned to make flat car loads to save a buck or two because those are very expensive. The very first one I'm gonna cover was a discovery I made when I did this clinic as a make and take a couple of years ago, um, marble. Marble, um, I discovered the Yule Marble Mine, mine in Montana or Colorado, Colorado. Um, it was discovered in 1874. It's 9,300 feet above sea level. The marble was used to build the tomb of the unknown soldier. These guys at 9,300 feet built their own hydroelectric plant to power their little electric train that they used to haul this marble. Now the neat thing about marble is it's found in every state of the union, including Alaska for that one guy that we have from Alaska. Um, we're gonna use it as a through train load that because we don't want to build the whole let me go to the next slide this is what they built on the side of the mountain which is actually a pretty cool building um so we don't want to build something like that um so we're just going to have the marble ride on a flat car through our railroad um they recently restarted this mine for refurbishing the Washington Monument because the marble, that particular marble is so white. And let's see, the pictures that I have, this is a their little tractor, steam powered tractor train. Um, these came off of a website that I have to give um, a shout out to Martin, martincooney.com if you ever wanna look up some really cool pictures. He is actually a marble carver, but he put up all of these historical photos and they're all free to download, which is really nice. This is their, again, this is the marble loaded on this steam powered train. I don't have a picture of the electric train. The next, this photo, um, this is what I started, wait, I missed one. This is what it started at. I got these um, containers of rock, decorative rock at Walmart, and they're all under $4, I think. You can get white. You can, if you're mo modeling a railroad that's back east, you can get a red, reddish looking rock that can sit in for red marble that they have back there. Um, I did the first thing I did was I took them, oops, sorry. <laughs> I took them out of the container and I got the biggest ones and I squared off some of the sides with a Dremel tool. Um, I highly recommend safety glasses and dust masks because it made a mess um, and it was tedious, but it's also, I think, got a better look than the marble that is rounded off. This, this is on the train on the car, how it looks. Now you could throw some chains over that. I saw it both ways. The marble is 6.7 pounds per square foot. So a 30 square foot piece of marble would weigh 200 pounds. That's according to Google, because I don't do math. Um, so you could, you could stack it on there. You can put it in, in a box. You know, you could put it on pretty much any car. I don't know about a box car, but... Um, I had a lot of, oops, I had a lot of marble left over from the clinic. So we'll be having a couple of cars going through. 
And then my next trick, barbed wire. I don't know, I got hooked on barbed wire. I just, um, it was invented in 1867, um, but it wasn't until 1874 that they had a practical machine to manufacture it. Now the railroad, the railroad actually um, used a lot of barbed wire to protect their tracks when they were going through cattle country because they got tired of paying for the cattle. And they had a unique kind of barbed wire and I forgot to put a picture of it, but it has one of the, one of the braided parts of the wire is square. And they had a patent on that because they got tired of the farmers and the ranchers stealing their wire. So that way they could walk up and they could see is that the wire belongs to the railroad if they saw anybody's fence being repaired. Um, but they used a lot of barbed wire. They used millions of pounds of barbed wire. And I thought, wow, that would be cool to try to make because it's expensive to buy. However, what was really difficult was I did watch a couple of YouTubes and I, I didn't really like how their barbed wire looked. It didn't look very realistic. So I started with this, it's a braided piece of silver beading wire. Now the beading wire is not the same as regular wire. It doesn't behave the same, but I made this by folding a piece in half. And then this part where the little circle is, I grabbed that folded piece with a pair of pliers and I chucked these other, the other end of it into our drill carefully and tightened it up. And then I hung on to the other end and I spun it very slowly to make this braided wire, which was kind of cool. That was actually very entertaining to do. Um, so I made a lot of those. This was the hard part, how to make the little, the little pointy things that stick out of the barbed wire, the actual barb. So I found this little pin here and this is, this is the braided, no, this is a regular piece of wire. I don't know what it was because we just had it sitting around. And I wrapped tiny loops around this, which is pretty monotonous to do, but I did it watching some TV. And I wound up with this, a long piece of these little curly pieces of this wire. So I slid this off of the pin and then I cut these in little two tiny two loop pieces as close as I could. And that was really tedious. Then this is the part that I, this was all I was developing a procedure. It did get easier. Um, this is what it looks like, which I think it looks pretty cool. I don't know about you guys, but I thought it looked like wire and these little pieces are those little loops that I cut off and I pushed them onto the wire. So then I wound up with this and I was going to make more of them and I actually had more of them made but only one survived. Um, the other is either under the couch or the cat has it somewhere. Um, but I thought this was something I was thinking of for our railroad. You could have a maintenance car, a rail maintenance car that had some barbed wire on it, a, piece, a couple of pieces of track, some, you know, ties, just have a, a car that just carried the stuff for the guys that did the, the maintenance on the track and use your barbed wire. Um, be prepared though. I wound up my, I made a lot of the little loops and I cut up a lot of those. So that way, if they popped off of the table and into the carpet, I wouldn't have to jump down and look for them. So it went a lot faster when we did that, but now my carpet's full of those little things. So the next, next thing I did, this was actually, I think I did this at the clinic I did a couple of years ago. Um, the rolled steel. I, it was invented in 1783. There's two different processes used for hot and cold roll. Um, and it, it only, the only deciding factor is what its usage is gonna be. 
So galvanized steel, oh wait, that's the next one, sorry. Um, so I found this metallic paper. I'm gonna look, you can see these rolls. You can make them any size, any scale. Um, you have to remember how heavy they're supposed to be, but it's also based on how thick the, the supposed pretend steel is. This is what I found. Um, this cardstock comes in silver, white silver, champagne pearl, and white gold. Um, this darker silver color is a great stand-in for the metal. This is my stand-in for the straps. And this is actually because um, our office stores have closed in town in Oak Harbor. We don't have Office Max or any place to get graphic tape anymore. This came from Sally's, um, the Sally's Beauty Supply. And it's fingernail. It's for fingernails. I don't know why women want to put striping tape on their fingernails, but it's really super thin and it's sticky on one side. And it's ideal for wrapping the rolls in. The next tool I came up with, this was just um, a piece of plastic I got for, you're supposed to use it for putting your shoes on. You're supposed to hook it on the back of the heel or something. But I cut a slit in it so I could wrap it. I could put my paper in it and I could wrap it. So I cut all these papers into, um, I think they're four foot wide in HO scale. And then I just rolled it up tight as I could. And then I took the little rolls and I put that tape on it. And here you go. Looks like rolled steel. And that too can go in different kinds of cars. It can, this is not exactly a, a flat car, but it's a crib. But anyway, so you got to pretend about the blocking and whatever you want to, you can do whatever you want to do. Um, my next, this was my, this was fun. Okay. I'm going too fast now, but we'll have lots of times for questions. So the galvanized steel was invented in 1836. Actually hot dipping galvanized metal would, that started 300 years ago. So it's been, a, it's been around a long time. I was gonna try making my own galvanized metal, but I discovered it's toxic chemicals. So it's zinc and it's mixed with something else. But the hot dipping is actually um, gonna last longer out in the field. It won't rust as fast. But it's used for chain cars and shipbuilding silos and cars. Um, you can paint this galvanized metal if you wash it and wipe it down with vinegar. So if you wanted to paint something out of galvanized metal, you could paint it. I didn't want to paint it because I had this idea that I was going to make steel, flat steel loads with it. So the first thing I had to buy <laughs> were these. These is the most money I ever spent on anything, but I can also use it for cutting chicken wire. So I'm okay with that. This was the straight, that this comes in a left, and a right hand cut and a straight cut. I had a right hand cut one that is not, it's not acceptable for what I wanted it for. So I bought this one and I really, it was really kind of cool because I took that decorative piece of dollar store or whatever it is, I, it's supposed to be a hashtag sign. I don't know why you would want that, but for a dollar I saw, I saw flat steel loads is what I saw. So I cut it up into four by eight sheets in HO scale. Um, I didn't measure the thickness of it, but I kind of think looking at the pictures now that I might have made them a little too, I shouldn't have stacked so many on a pallet, um, but there they are. And I'm really kind of proud of those. Those are gonna cruise down our railroad just fine. Um, I think I would put fewer sheets on there next time. Um, but they look pretty good for being galvanized steel. You throw some rust and dust on there, weather it up a little bit. We could be going out to one of the factories, build a silo. That, that's what I did with the dollar store galvanized metal. The next 
The next one I did, these didn't take very long to do either. And I, I only used up two of those. One was a practice one. So this whole stack cost me less than a dollar and I still have more left. So that's a pretty good deal for a flat car load. So then I saw these galvanized letters and I thought they were really cute. I couldn't imagine what I was gonna use them for. And then I brought them home. I made friends with them. Now the size, it doesn't tell you the size of these, but the size of these in HO scale is approximately eight feet tall. So you'd have to put them on a pretty big building, which is what I did. I made a sign to go on a big building. Um, this is not my, my best effort because I was trying to, I was rushing to get it done. Um, but uh, eventually I'm gonna solder a frame for this and, and it'll be cruising to some big city to go on top of some big factory is what I think. But, um, and I was gonna put some chains on it but I couldn't find any to drape over it. But I thought that was kind of cool. I didn't know, you know, you guys might think it's kind of dumb but <laughs> I thought it was pretty fun to have a big old sign on a flat car going somewhere. And my inspiration for the project we did, the di remember the diorama contest, you guys, I were, I think you guys remember that when we did the dioramas for the flat car loads, this was my inspiration. This is a NASA, I love NASA. Their whole idea is if it fits, it ships. And they built this, this is, um, I don't remember what kind of tank it was, but it was for NASA. And of course I lost the writing that was on the, the picture, but I built this. This is my UFO. I skipped one picture. That's the top. There's actually a, an alien inside of there. Um, I had a ton of fun. The diorama included the men in black, a big black car, <laughs> little tiny aliens, and um, some army guys. And it was pretty cool. It actually, these lights worked at one time, the battery died and I didn't wanna crack it open to change the battery. So, cause it's all started, there it is again. It all started from these because I was walking through the dollar store looking for something I could use that was round. And this was the shape and I cut this part off and then I rounded it out. The bottom side of it has a little flat piece too that I had to cut out. And then I sanded all that plastic down. So I just had this round part and I made this flush so that they were flush together on top of each other. And then I found this, I'll show you this. This was a, the lid off of a face cream jar, a little tiny face cream jar that became, I cut all of this out and then with a Dremel tool and then I just use this top part of it. And this was the light, this is what's left of the, the inside of it is actually a Halloween, one of those flashing pumpkin lights that you see when at Halloween where you can set it inside the pumpkin. And I took the whole thing apart and I, this is just the light part. This is a, a different one, the one I actually use because I couldn't find that again. But you separate these lights and the back of it is the, the, all the electronic stuff, which is only like four things. Um, it's a resistor and some wires and something else, I think. Um, but I tucked that inside of the UFO and then I drilled holes for the lights. So that's what you see up here sticking out. It had a switch, um, but the switch got stuck on on and I couldn't fix it. So that's why the battery died. But these all lit up for the meeting that we had for the contest. I got most humorous. <laughs> and then this is the finish was uh, I, I, after I sanded it down on the outside, I, I put a gray primer on it, but it didn't, it didn't look spaceship like. So I used um, this looking glass paint is pretty cool. It didn't, 
it didn't go on like this. It went on kind of kind of like a an old beat up UFO that's been traveling through space for a really long time. And then I lightly coated it with the satin finish to give it a little bit of a sheen. And that was it. And then I have this miscellaneous cool stuff because that fingernail tape that I was talking about at Sally's comes in these cool colors, like this black and white stripe that looked like it could be some kind of safety thing on a bumper. This is your basic yellow safety tape, stuff like that. And this was the best thing that I bought in I don't know how long. Um, this glue, this glue glues everything. It doesn't smell bad. It glued metal to metal. It glued metal to wood, metal to paper, metal to plastic. It glued everything I wanted it to glue. And it was, it gets tacky enough within a few seconds that it will hold it in place. But if you need to move it, you got like 20 minutes to decide. It's like, it's similar to Eileen's only it gets stickier faster. So you can hold things in place quicker. But I, I loved it. I glued everything with it. It was amazing. So I got it at Walmart on the aisle that has all of their um, hobby stuff. So if you go looking for that, pick it up if you see it. And I'm done way too soon. So I guess I'll open it up for questions. I talk too fast. That's pretty Susan? much it, you guys. Susan? Took me Listen. all day. <laughs> yes. Susan, uh, this is Paul Rising. Um, I've uh, I've uh, made a uh, project of doing uh, open loads for the History Museum layout in Tacoma. Oh. And, and because we are a uh, uh, an operating railroad, uh, I wanted to make all of our loads or most all of them removable. And when you do that, uh, you have this change of weight of the cars when you have no loads versus loads. And so uh, one of the things that uh, I found was kind of tricky to do is to keep the loads as light as possible and then make sure that the weight of the car was, if not right on, not much less than that the NMRA uh, requirements or recommendations for car weights. And so uh, right away, I found that when I was dealing with what I'm gonna call heavier materials like simulated steel loads or uh, granular loads and so forth, I had to make sure that, uh, that they were very light, uh, you know? And so, uh, so that, was a, that was an issue. What I, for the uh, sheet steel stuff, what I ended up doing is you know, there's some really good uh, spray model paints that simulate the galvanized steel look. And so mm -hmm. I just used styrene uh, and, and spray painted that and then did a little bit of weathering as you were recommending. And so I could keep those loads very light, but mm -hmm. made them removable uh, on the flat cars and basically used... Um, uh, you know, the wood cribbing like you many times see with, with any of those, uh, I'm going to call piecemeal kind of loads, but I use those uh, pins, uh, you know, the pin pockets that are there mm -hmm. along the side of a flat car made sure that things were able to be secured either by dropping into those pin holes or at least spanning the width of the car. So that, that worked uh, pretty well. You know, as you were started to talk about the, the marble, um, you know, folks are going to be interested in the actual weight of the volume of the marble or steel or whatever heavyweight material that's there. And just, just to let people know, because you can figure it out based upon the volume, but the, the volume weight of marble is 160 pounds per cubic foot. So 12 inches by 12 inches by 12 inches uh, is 160 pounds. 
for steel, it's 495 pounds per cubic foot. So, you know, the, the weight of that, you know, big blocks of rock on a, on a flat car versus pieces of big sheet steel is, is going to be going to look significantly different because there's, you know, quite a bit of difference in the volume weight. Of, mm -hmm. So, you know, that, that was an issue. I'm, you know, on that uh, fingernail uh, uh, tape, I'm very interested in that. Initially, when you mentioned it, I was thinking, oh, they must use that for masking, you know, because they're, because they do these different designs on ladies' uh, fingernails. My wife isn't one of them, so I don't have any. Yeah, person. I, I'm not a fingernail person either. No, they actually do make designs. They do stripes on, on fingernails with it. It comes, I bought, I think it was a package of 10. Um, I, it was expensive, I thought at the time, but it came in all different colors. I mean, you could use it to pinstripe cars, you could use it to, to pinstripe a building, you could, I mean, I could think of a million uses for it. Um, Where did you get that? I got it at Sally's Beauty Supply. Okay. And, and I don't, I, I, the reason I got it there is because as usual, our our town doesn't have a lot of places to buy supplies like that. Um, I I did order some chart tape from Amazon, but that was like five dollars for one roll. And yeah, in this really case, I got that nifty little plastic holder with the nail tape, which mm -hmm. was worth its weight in gold. Once I started, once I figured out how to use it, because it's so thin. Um, but it's got sticky stuff on the back, so it doesn't move once you get it down in place and, and rub it in. So, yeah, I guess the ladies with the long nails use it for stripes on their nails. Oh, interesting. Uh, I, it's kind of, I don't know. It's, I'm not a nail person, but it is at Sally's Beauty Supply. Over yeah, and it doesn't, doesn't have much of a doesn't have much of a profile. In other words, it's pretty flat in comparison. Yeah, it stays pretty flat. Yeah, okay. it's like okay. down on on the paper and I did it on the on that steel too it stuck right to it well that's, I don't know I, I wouldn't call that steel from dollar stores some kind of mystery metal I'm sure but yeah uh, yeah I as far as the weight thing I did um I was after I saw the picture of the the cut stuff I realized that I should have only had like two sheets of that her, because I didn't measure it after I cut it. I didn't measure it on a, on the HO scale ruler, but I'm pretty sure that was probably one inch thick steel. And I know how much that that weighs a lot. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, yeah. So and the rocks actually are pretty lightweight. They, I mean, they'll they'll keep your car's not going to slide around. But it's putting three on there was not stressing the car out at all. And yeah. they did drive. They did drive with. <laughs> They put those rocks on there. They put like a, I don't know how many thousands of pounds it was, but there was a gigantic piece that they had on it, filled up the whole flat car. There was a picture yeah. of the guy standing on it. And I was like, God, they, they really didn't pay a lot of attention. I guess you just load it till it breaks. Yeah. Well, the issue, of course, is, is, the, uh, is the whole NMRA uh, mm -hmm. recommendation for the weight of the car just so that you don't end up uh, streamlining uh, a train as it's going around a, a bend or something like that with a really mm -hmm. overweight car uh, yeah. or something we that's haven't, really we, I, can, yeah. I have to say we haven't actually run our cars around our track um, with our loads on it yet because we're still rebuilding our train so we got it all in boxes <laughs> but uh, yeah so you know, it, it would depend. You could, maybe you'd only put two of those on there, but they don't weigh a lot. I will say that they're pretty lightweight. That yeah. steel, though, would that, that was probably way overloaded for what the NMRA standards are. I just yeah. did it for the yeah. picture. I don't know if you've <laughs> ever. I don't know if you've ever uh, uh, looked at the uh, NMRA bulletin and seen the, uh, you know, love those open loads segment there but typically there's a fella who uh who has these unusual open loads in the in the bulletin magazine and uh, yes and uh and i've challenged him both uh, in person at the national convention as well as online is to say that why don't you make any of these removable because 
you know, <laughs> flat cars, mm -hmm. uh, though it, they're just not going to be running back and forth uh, with either a load on them or just empty. Uh, you know, they're they're intended to move a variety of things. So uh, a flat car ought to have several different loads that are that are possible on them. So, uh, but he still hasn't done it. He he recognizes that that's something he just hasn't gotten around to tackling. So. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the, those are the the rocks and the steel and the and the rolled paper are all removable. None of none of them were glued down. So Very that is good. something that I would probably have to research the weight thing and figure out what how many I could stack on there, and then go with that. And then you could take them off when you're done. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So this is this rich. Um, Excellent clinic, by the way. Um, very imaginative use of all kinds of different things that, you know, stuff you just find and then figure out how to make something out of it. That's kind of a, um, I wouldn't say it's a lost art, but it's definitely a diminishing uh, skill that we're seeing in model railroading where the, everybody just wants to buy stuff off the shelf or somebody 3D printed something and there's not a whole lot of creativity involved. So what you're presented, what you presented here was, is very interesting and provides a little inspiration to look at things a little bit different, differently when you're walking through the store. Um, I had, there's a couple of questions on the chat room. One was um, marble is softer than granite. So you need to consider that when you're ordering your headstone. So if you want it to last a long time. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've actually noticed I've actually noticed that at the old cemetery that the the marble headstones, the old ones, like from the 1800s or whatever, they're it's very hard to read the inscriptions that are on there. Whereas the granite yeah. ones that are that are there, you can read those pretty readily. So I've ordered, yeah, a, I found that I've, out ordered too. A, I've ordered a large uh, block of basswood for mine. <laughs> <laughs> the other question was, uh, do you know what the first use of corrugated metal was? Um, that was not very, they, they actually figured out how to do that not very long after they came out with the sheet steel. Because all that is, I watched, I watched a video on it. They just take rollers on either side of that sheet metal and they just press those folds into the metal that you see on corrugated metal. It was a very simple process. The sheet metal goes in there and then they put the rollers on either side and it just clamps it down and puts that bend in it and pops out as a piece of corrugated metal. So it wasn't very long after the, the uh, sheet metal was invented before they came up with that. And I don't recall, I didn't read anything about why they came up with corrugated metal other than I, maybe the rain rolled off of it better. I don't, I don't know. It's stronger. It's, it's stronger. stronger. Corrugated no, is stronger. It's more self-supporting. Oh, okay. That's why they use it for buildings then. Yeah very handy for a roofing material and and uh, there is a uh, a modern airplane a very high performance airplane that uses that design in the spore web on the wing the model mm -hmm. will remain unnamed but uh, the design is is uh, very uh, very useful well the ford trimotor had uh, corrugated metal and that was obviously it had to happen before the 20s and i i my research since I'm doing turn of the century, I wanted to make sure that my roofing and whatever else kind of material would be uh, prototypical or, or at least era specifically correct. So that was the reason for the question. Another thing they used it for was pipe. I thought it was right. interesting that the 300 years that they were doing, they discovered how to hot dip the metal into the zinc to create the galvanizing. 300 years ago, I, some guy just said, hey, I got this pot of zinc and I'm going to dip the metal in it and see what it does. It's pretty cool. Well, for centuries, they've been experimenting with uh, 
uh, with different metals and steel and so forth, uh, usually uh, due to weapons technology, you know, like making uh, swords and spears and shields and that sort of stuff. So that's that's been around for for quite a while too. Another uh, um, rust resisting metal that's been around for a while is wrought iron. Susan, this is Alan Murray. <clears throat> I thought it was interesting that um, you uh, added a little bit of flavor to your presentation by giving us a little history of when it was invented and those kinds of things. Well, thank you. I, I When I'm researching things, I like to figure out the era that it was used in originally, and then, you know, you could move that forward if you have a later, later years that you're modeling, you could, you know, address, like the barbed wire, I, that really surprised me too, because I had no idea they were using that way back when, but it was the railroad that really drove the interest. It, they did not like having to pay for dead cows on the tracks. They seriously didn't want to part with the money. So they, they were the ones that galvanized the, the inventor to come up with a way to make that barbed wire that they could identify as theirs, which I thought was really kind of interesting too. Um, making it, um, if, if you guys need a roll of that, I'll, I'll make it for about 50 bucks an hour. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really a tedious, but it, I really liked the look of it when I was done with it. I was really pleased with it. If I could figure out how to roll that beading wire up in a tighter loop, that's, that's weird stuff, that beading wire. It doesn't behave like regular wire. Susan? Mm -hmm. A suggestion as an alternative to all of that effort. Uh, my wife is into needlework and I think that there is some thread that you can get. It's a metallic thread uh, that has, um, I, I'm not sure I'd call it barbs, but it, it has a level of fuzziness, if you will. Uh, roughness on the surface that I think if you wound it around uh, something that, that you could basically cover, you know, a dowel or something like that, mm -hmm. uh, you could, uh, it could be a pretty convincing looking uh, piece of, or a roll of, of barbed wire. I know that I've uh, used some similar material as cabling, really fine cabling to hold loads mm -hmm. down to uh, to the uh, to a flat car or a cribbing, and I think that there's some stuff that is a little bit uh, uh, it's got enough texture to it. It it might be convincing enough. So you might you might look uh, look in the, the hobby areas of the stores where they have uh, what do they call it embroidery floss. Okay. It's yeah, a, I've seen um, that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's just a suggestion. Yeah. Well, I'm willing to try. I, I actually like how it came out and I'll probably finish up a couple more lengths of it at some point. Just, uh, it's something to do while I'm watching TV. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I don't know that I, I don't think that when they make, when they do the YouTube videos, I don't think they make a lot of effort to make it look realistic because they're build, they're they're making it for like their war games and things like that not really trying for a realistic look i don't think cuz one guy just braided it together and then cut peak chunks on it and called it good which i guess i could have but i'm kind of ocd <laughs> so i i like to have it look good too but yeah i i'm going to all experiment around with that one Phil said to me today was the nicest thing he said in a long time is we got the coolest loads for our train, <laughs> which I thought was pretty cool. Yeah, we're going to have really cool flat car loads. <laughs> well, right? thanks, Susan, for yeah. providing Thank our you, presentation Susan. tonight. Thank you, Susan. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you, Paul. This is a presentation of the NMRA Pacific Northwest Region 4th Division Skagit Valley and Whidbey Island Clinic. Thanks for participating.